Our next session for the day, ladies and gentlemen, is how open AI and ML will change the way we consume financial services and business transformation. Fintech, which includes everything from online banking to investment platforms, uses technology to offer effective and convenient financial solutions. Through chatbots and virtual assistants, conversational AI powered by machine learning has revolutionized client interactions. Let's learn how conversational AI is transforming customer interactions the finance sector and company transformation. Let us hear in detail about how OpenAI and ML will change the way we consume finance, financial services and business transformation. This session will be moderated by Mr. Ravi Shankar, who is the Chief Executive Officer, Active AI, a Gupshap IO company. Welcome, uh, Ravi Shankar. Uh, and our esteemed speakers for this session are Abhishek Rongta, who's the founder and CEO Indus Net Technologies. May I welcome Abhishek on stage, please? We also have with us Mr. Balaji Rajagopalan, who's the Chief Technology Officer, State Bank of India. Welcome, sir. And we have with us Sunil Bajpai, Chief Trust Officer, Tanla Platforms. Thank you so much. May I now ask Ravi to take it from here. Thank you. Uh, fascinating to see a stand, standing audience here. I mean, it's, it's really, please, please do take a seat. And uh, apologies uh, if you can hear. Can you hear us all? Oh, sounds good. Great. Very exciting time uh, in the world. Anybody here who has not heard the word AI? All right. Anybody here who's working on AI? Oh, my God. Awesome. Right, so we've got a great audience here today, and I'm, I'm sure uh, there's a lot for us to take away from today's session. Um, very excited to have my co-panelists here today. Uh, between the three of them, I think they serve well over three-fourths of India's population. So all of our discussions today are going to be population scale, right? Because what we do, what we have, our country has achieved using the India stack um, using uh, our Aadhaar stack has been phenomenal. It's never been, uh, been, you know, I can't think of any other country coming even close to it. So most countries are now adopting it. Can we do the same with AI, right? Because today, AI is all about how we can improve lives, right? And to do that, we need to make AI as good as electricity, make it reach everyone, everywhere, and power, you know, the entire economy. Financial services is one such domain, right? So today's conversations are going to be a little provocative. Um, we're going to ask um, questions to ourselves, and hopefully you'll have very interesting questions to ask. But I will start with the first one, which is just the word open, right? How many of you think the word you know, the AI that we have today in the world is actually open. I don't see any hand going up. So, yeah, it's scary. So we need to create frameworks which allow us to understand what AI is really doing, especially in financial services. We talk a lot about it. Does anybody know here any AI chief of AI in any bank, in any financial institution? There are no hands. Because we're talking about an AI era, and we don't have a single AI officer in any bank as yet. So we really need to start thinking at scale, and also, more importantly, at strategic level, how this is going to play out. So welcome, my co-panelists. What we're going to do here is I have a set of three, four questions. Depending on time, we'll run through this uh, in, a, in whichever order. And anyone can take up, but I would love everybody's comments on this. And we leave sufficient time for our audience to ask a lot more questions, right? All right. So my first question to you uh, goes back to where I started, where we are at uh, scale on digital public goods. And you know, everybody in the world is amazed at what we did. We built that on open source. We built open protocols. We built on open participation. And that's why. It's available to every Indian today. 
There's no other system which touches 1.2 billion people, or 1.3 at this point in time. Right? So what's the promise of AI? So my question to you is if we as India provide an open protocol, an open standard, both for the algorithms as well as the way in which we store and manage the data and all the knowledge that goes through, can we impact financial services in a meaningful manner? So your comments, please. We can start with you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, we take care of uh, difficult things in the headlines or in the name. That's why we have OpenAI. And, uh, but it's tough. And, uh, and I want to add one item besides open, which to my mind is open source uh, and, and all that, which you mentioned, is interoperability. The success of India Stack and, and the population scale uh, that we are talking about is also because of interoperability, I think. Uh, uh, like, the, like the ONDC, for instance. It's, it's nothing more than a set of protocols, a way to connect with each other. The foundation is there. Uh, and uh, foundational services are, are available and, and we are able to connect them in a way that makes uh, a distributed, you know, uh, large-scale uh, ecosystem to develop or emerge out of it. So, uh, so of course, there is place uh, for, for open. It has to be open, both for democratic access to data, to, for, uh, for for transparency, for uh, for uh, people to trust. My job is trust. So for people to trust what they are seeing, what the AI is telling them, or what the systems are doing or not doing, for all that, open is crucial. And uh, so open and uh, interoperable, I think, are the, uh, are the key words here. Fabulous. Thanks. You, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, happy to be part of this forum. Uh, many, many times people misunderstand AI as a fancy item. I would just go back to the customer service. Providing a better customer experience, taking care of the operational efficiency for the financial institution are extremely important, so the customer service is taken care, as well as the bank operational efficiency is taken care. If the bank operational efficiency is not taken care, the customer service will be impacted, right? So both are extremely important. So starting from the open AI, fundamentally are we having open sources which are created from India? The, the, the kind of diversified population which India has. India has demonstrated the capabilities of uh, strong IT. Uh, we are far ahead of US. We are far ahead of in terms of digitization compared to many countries. So uh, we have demonstrated, we as a country have demonstrated all these capabilities. From coming back to the open sources, uh, we should promote more and more open sources coming from India. Of course, many of the Indians do work from US and we create certain opportunities. But uh, this kind of forum is very important to say that how do you promote uh, creation and pattern from India, number one. Number two is realistic of what will be the real use case from a customer service point of view. Everybody talks about AIML. I've been in various IT companies. I worked in various uh, financial institutions. So I've seen both path of IT. Me as a customer, I should be provided a contextual-based customer service. What does it mean? Right from onboarding till customer service, in any transaction I undergo, I should feel that I have a personal alarm, need not be physically available. So how will I make sure that when I, when I get an onboarding, how will I make sure that my onboarding becomes easier? Your ability to capture the documents, your ability to ensure that what I have captured, I do upfront validation, not be accepting documents, and then say, come back, your document is rejected, your application form is rejected. So we need to understand what are the real needs in the financial institution. Similarly, getting a conversation AI. If you look at Amazon Prime, you will not see a call center. It's all virtual. We have developed this, but uh, global partners are getting the benefits. How do you ensure that I get a contextual-based customer service? So getting a virtual assistance, which is as good as a personal alarm at my home desk, extremely important. So few things, I think, uh, uh, so Sunil already mentioned about the interoperability and other things. I'll just take it to the subsequent questions. Yeah, Vishak. 
So I think uh, AI is more like a fundamental infrastructure, uh, which is basically operating at a, uh, uh, I would say, uh, application and data layer. And uh, anything which is so fundamental and which is so widespread, I would like to compare it with the operating systems and the web service servers, which are already available at a mass scale. This means billions of people are already using it. So the moment you look at that, you will see that the open source concept and model has always surpassed any closed source model. Because people there want to see high level of trust and transparency. People want to see... And we'll explore the global landscape of embedded finance with a specific focus on the Indian market. The panel will discuss the strategies for implementing embedded finance across the value chain the importance of partnership and ecosystem, emerging trends and challenges of integrating financial services into non-financial products and services. To understand more about this topic, which is shaping the future of embedded finance, strategies, partnership, and future trends, may I please call upon on stage the moderator of this session, Mr. Vivek Bigalvi. So Vivek sir is a partner fintech leader, alliances and ecosystem leader, PWC. So sir will be sharing a, a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here this afternoon. I look after the fintech practice in PwC, which we started probably around six, eight years back, and this is an area of passion. And if I had to pick up an area within the broader fintech, which we called quite early as one which has a lot of potential, was the embedded finance space. Uh, so today we're going to launch a report. I would request the presentation to come up on the screen. I will give you a flavor of what we have covered on the report so that when we have a discussion within our panel, we got some rough structure around which uh, we, could, we could have a conversation. So the core area of embedded finance for us, and we called our thought leadership at that time called Sashay Products, was to say that selling financial services in many areas is quite complex. Well, there are many areas like payments, lending, et cetera, which have evolved. But we felt there is a market for specific spaces which are invisible which can get embedded contextually. And none of it is really new. If like we were just chatting in a panel before we started, anyone who has taken a home loan knows that our insurance is bundled within that, is invisible. You don't even choose which insurance provider. You can ask for an option, but it's kind of de facto bundled. Uh, travel insurance, all of us are comfortable with. Are just one or two examples. But the broad thematic was, was to see that, can we replicate the story across the table? So in our report today, we have looked at and it will get distributed to everyone, but I'll just give you a broad contour of the aspects we have studied. Uh, one aspect is to say which all products are relevant for it. My panelists today, we're going to focus up quite a bit on insurance, which is a product which required a lot of sales channel to sell with, but with embedded, that ease has come in across both protection category as well as the risk categories. The second aspect we'll explore is how the broader digitization of the allied economy and ecosystem whether it is the health industries, retail and consumer, commerce, so on and so forth has made the rails possible for the embedment to happen. The third aspect is, which again we'll deliberate a little bit more in a panel discussion is, for the embedment to really happen, there has to be a lot of flexibility and agility in the manufacturers of these products, which could be the core insurance companies themselves or new age insurance companies, but who would require a lot more agile stack because suddenly you're not controlling the product. Someone outside is controlling the product, you're doing a supply. A fair bit of evolution and transformation would be required on the supply side. So those are the broad thematics. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, invite MC back on the stage to invite the panel. Uh, we will we'll go through the discussion and then come back and launch the report. Thank you, sir. So now let me invite the panelists for this discussion. So starting from Mr. Ariji Chakrabarti, Managing Director, Asia Pacific, Cover Genius. Can we please welcome sir on stage? <laughs> Mr. Saurabh Mehta, Global Head of Affinity Business, InsureMo.com. 
Mr. Chirag Kriplani, founder and COO of IOConnect. <laughs> Mr. Sumit Agarwal, SVP, Product and Business, Make My Trip. So you can take it over from here. Thank you so much. I think we were just chatting before this conversation happened and probably I'll kickstart from where we left off there. Uh, for the audience outside the embedded finance world, embedded insurance world, it at some point can look over simplistic right? because embedment as the act itself gives you a sense of just put it somewhere and forget it, it happens. So maybe as an opening query, why don't we peel that onion a little bit, talk about what are the nuances in embedment in, in I'll go across the room, maybe Arjit, I'll start with you. What are the nuances? Uh, what kind of product categories do you think are amenable, something which are not amenable? What are the sectors in your experience that you have explored with? I'll start with you. Sure. Thank you, Vivek. And thank you for having me here. So um, to answer this question, I'll just uh, f spend a few seconds to discuss what we do as a company because that will lead to that answer. So Cover Genius is, uh, we are global leaders in embedded protection. And by which what we do is we, were, we enable world's largest digital companies to come up with insurance and protection solutions in the primary path of purchase. So take our clientele from large retailers like Amazon, eBay, Shopee, um, Flipkart in, in this part of the world, uh, where we enable solutions, insurance solutions in their primary path. When you're buying, suppose, a gadget or a furniture, we will find our product available there. Similarly with OTAs, one of our partners is Make My Trip, Sumit is sitting here. Um, then we work with all the large OTAs globally from Booking Holdings uh, to Agoda, Skyscanner, um, is my trip and other guys where we again provide similar solutions to them and that cut across any digital whether it's ride hailing like Uber or Ola or whether it's fintech like Revolut and other partners globally. Now coming back to your question is what are the sectors we are seeing where the embedded journey can work and your first question was what are the challenges uh, for that. So answering this second question first is the verticals we see is when you are putting something embedded you need to make the product simple and seamless for people to understand. So what we do is coming up with products which are contextual by nature. So we map out what is a consumer journey in a particular platform, where a product can be introduced to create a product differentiation, and we plug in that particular product, which kind of in the same journey, you click on one checkbox, you go to the cart, you make the payment, you are done your policy issuance to operations to claims processing, everything is automated, right? So if you look at retail, travel, fintech, these are very easy bundled product which is available. But if you go to a higher, uh, in terms of a premium value, uh, suppose you're looking at a complex life insurance product or an investment linked product, or looking at an auto product uh, where you need a more comprehensive understanding of what product you're buying, it is very difficult to distribute that as one-click online support, right? You need, sure. you need uh, uh, intermediary, whether it's a B2A to C, like an agency or someone intermediary to intervene and explain to you that product. So that's where I think embedded to, to a large extent is evolving, but is still scratching the surface on products which are more simplistic. Wherever the advisory piece comes in, and we'll come back to that point, very valid point. Sort of from your experience, and again, with your unique vantage point, where do you see the opportunities? And just a nuance on what really are the kind of products which work. Yeah, so I think first I'll also, you know, cover a little bit on, on how the industry has evolved and what are the... Hello, hello, yeah, hello, yeah. So, um, just touching on sort of continuing from what Arijit was saying, right? Um, embedded insurance to what we are seeing currently is, you are right, is oversimplistic, right? We are rationally from that $250 billion market that we want to hit. A lot of studies are saying, you know, um, by 2030. I think currently we are scratching the surface. We are still working on simple products like warranties and travel and maybe credit life, you know, going into embedded insurance. The point is, what, are, what is the key challenge in achieving that big $250 billion number? That's where we are heading, right? Uh, 
the challenge is your cost of experimentation. So right now, if you look at fintech companies, you look at wallets, um, everyone is trying to become a super app. When you're trying to become a super app, you want to sell multiple insurance products, but it is not that easy to reach the product market fit. To reach the product market fit, you need to experiment at a low cost. Now that low cost means, first of all, the channels who want to launch it, the fintech company who wants to launch it, they should be able to launch faster, experiment, see what works, what doesn't work. But behind the scenes, there are insurance companies who are actually providing and they are the manufacturers of that product. So what we do is we work on both sides of businesses, right? So we help insurance companies to become more digital, lower their cost of experimentation because these are bite-sized product, right? We are not even talking about complicated products and heavy duty, you know, higher ticket price items. We're talking about bite-sized products. So unit economics doesn't work if your cost of experimentation is high. So you need to be able to launch products really fast. You need to experiment really fast see what works and, and, and move on and, and you know, uh, reach to the right product market fit. So again, I think it is tried and tested for simple products like travel and warranties and maybe Credit Live was talking about, but if you want to go deeper into you know, how can you embed large ticket size item, what, what Arjit was saying, and, and you know, even with more simple, you know, on simple side also, you know, more products can be explored. That is the challenge we need to overcome from a tech standpoint. Um, and I think I'd probably leave it there. Understood. Good point on cost of experimentation, maybe in my mind, cost of service as well, like it can't be. Well, selling advisory is important, even the supposed sales service is very costly, intermediation will anyways come in. Uh, Chirak, your views? Yeah. Hi, thank you. So um, I think in my, my opinion, we need to see the role of, um, you know, the provider, the enabler, us, uh, IOConnect being an enabler in Indonesia, actually we power up about 17 banks uh, to embed a um, couple of use cases, right from bill payments to lifestyle to even travel and, and uh, payments. Um, and also the, um, you know, um, so there's the provider, there's, this, uh, there's the enabler and also the platform, right? So if we look at embedded um, you know, payments and lending, I think the platform really, really requires it and needs it, and they request the provider saying, hey, please plug in. It's, it's a pull product, but then from an from a insurance standpoint, and also happy to learn from fellow panelists, insurance product or any other investment products is actually a push mechanism. Where we see is that the, the provider itself tends to say, hey, you know, platform, please, embed my experience, embed my journey, ex embed my uh, product because I want to start selling, I want to tap into that market. So I think the challenges are fairly different, right? But where we see um, as an enabler, I do understand that uh, when, when we work with banks, I think it's about um, they embed these use cases, but they're not the perfect guys around customer experience and the journey, right? And but what you write on top, the apps, those will be the prompts. Those will be your differentiators, the business rules, the apps that come on top, right? So I think we have a long way to go, but somebody needs to, you know, bell the cat on this one, at least, to do that. But that brings a following question, which is an even bigger challenge in this country, because if you look at AI, tremendous resources required. I'll start with people, right? How many machine learning PhDs do we have? How many PhDs do we have in this country who are working on Indian problems? I don't think so. Most of us work on solving problems to build better ML for what the American te technology companies do. So how are we going to solve that for India? That's one. So talent pool, right? That's a bigger challenge. The second challenge is chipsets. A lot of these uh, you know, uh, platforms require enormous compute power. We don't manufacture chips in this country. Chipsets of GPUs and all are sold out for the next three years. There's not, the waiting time is three, four, five years. So you really captive to what um, you know, other companies have actually colonized. Right? So as a country, how do we go about that? Sunil sir, start with you. Very tough question. Yeah, it is. How do we do this? It is uh, a tough question, but it's a question that we have to put our minds to. Uh, and, and we need to find a way uh, out of this uh, so, uh, first thing is the challenge that was put to us by Sam Altman himself, that yeah. you know, you can't do it. We have to show him that we can do it, just like we did with UPI, that you can't do payments in this country, but we did. 
we just didn't use credit cards or plastic. We, we did it with, uh, with an identifier alone. So we will need to build those, uh, those, those key foundational services mm. and, and, uh, and we'll do it in our own way. We will do it by, by feeling the stones as they say, you know, when you cross a, uh, cross a river, you feel the stones and you, uh, you build it like that. And having built it, we would build apps on top because it is the apps. Again, I'll come back to what all of these people are doing. They're not building India stack. They, are, they want to build apps. They will build it and use this, this infrastructure. Both the government has a responsibility in helping build that, that and some large uh, uh, visionaries, perhaps, and some large organizations. They have to contribute to it. And then everybody else has to, has to build uh, what they would like to build on, on top of that. Unless this happens on top of that, there is no point in the infrastructure. What have you built the infrastructure for? Right. So, so, so that's important. That is what will drive the creation of the, the infrastructure. That is where the value comes, uh, uh, from where we extract the value to build, build the, uh, the infrastructure. So, so it'll come. It'll come. We'll do it in our unique Indian way, I'm sure. And, um, and we will collaborate. And that's the only way we can, we, uh, we can succeed. We will learn from the mistakes that others have made already. And, uh, and that works. I want to leave you with one, uh, one example. S uh, a graduate student tried to build a toaster. A toaster was built more than a hundred years ago. He, but he tried to build a toaster himself. He tried to build this toaster from first principles. Extract his own metal. Extract the pigments that are required. Draw the wires, right? He tried. Took him a year. Toaster barely warmed at the end of his efforts and fused as soon as he, he loaded it uh, beyond a point. The thing is, even a toaster is impossible to build if you do it yourself, right? If you start thinking of all the extraction industries that must come before it and all the manufacturing that must come before it, toaster is extremely, I mean, it's impossible for any one of us to attempt to build it. But we can build toasters, we can build cars, we, we put uh, Chandrayaan on the moon. Right? By leveraging what collaboratively happens and what foundations uh, others have uh, laid down for us, AI is just at the moment where India needs to put those foundations in place and I think we can realize that maximum potential out of it. Yeah, thank you. So, most, some of you will be knowing in US, Every year, there is an award given for the best NLP engine. So, I think it's high time for India. We should also promote uh, Made in India. Uh, government is also looking for that with the support from regulators and uh, what we initiatives we're having this kind of forum. I think it's important that within India, we should start promoting startups, IT companies to build open sources based out of India, make in India. Because finally, whoever are working in abroad, most of them are Indians. People go to do research abroad because they get a better pay, they get a better career path. So I think high time India should start promoting, which is already happening, we should start promoting such kind of forums where we will promote hardcore tech resources. After 10 years, typically the IT companies, they become managers. They become manager after managers. I come from hardcore tech background. At this stage, I do a code review of certain things delivered by biggies like Microsoft, Google. Not joking. I think, I think the progress should be in terms of, especially in these areas, we need to promote some hardcore tech people, promote them for some kind of every year, like same, same forum. I think next year we should have a forum where saying that some of the best proven open sources developed in India. Number two, the startups. I started learning AML from the startups. Everybody, anybody who wants to learn AML should learn from the startups because without knowing the foundation, you can't go to 50th floor. Learn the basics. Get some few examples, lively examples for your own organization. Don't do a fancy thing. Pick up the problem statement. For that problem statement, which is the right solution. Pick up the, some of the startups. Implement it. In this journey, I've seen the startups have to learn one thing. They have to focus on scale. They have to focus on deployment architecture. They have to think about the security. This is one area which takes a lot of time. 
what I see as a window shopping, as a demonstration, the POCs, is very good. But if it ends to deployment, it takes two years to even get to the state, no deployment state. So to summarize, we should promote more and more researchers in India, make sure that we have a celebration out of it so that there's an incentive, motivation for people to promote these kind of people. Like yesterday I saw some like, you know, four million being given to some of the best talented uh, outcomes. Promote these kind of organizations. Build enterprise platform capabilities. Think about the scale, think about the data privacy, think about the security at every layer. If you focus on the scale, security, deployment architecture for largest banks, large banks, large financial institutions, or any industry for that matter, startups will, will zoom. One of the areas where startups fail is on the scale and the sustenance. Thanks. Thanks. So um, and I believe that you know I'm an eternal optimist, being an entrepreneur for almost 25 years. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, first of all, and I work with a lot of startups, and what I learned is that there's a massive amount of talent in India. There is no lack of talent. And as we also understood with the Chandrayaan launch, that what we call tier two, tier three talent, if they can put, you know, a satellite a rover on the moon, right, in the second attempt, then it's an amazing success. And I think that, that shows the depth of talent in India. I think what we need is basically directing the talent in the right direction, which again can be done by having proper policy discourse and explaining people what the country needs and where we are heading and bringing them together in an open forum. So that is on the talent side. Second, if I come on the infrastructure side, on the chipset side, as we said, I think India is again pushing very heavily on the Atmanirbhar part of the chipsets. Plus, I think the Moore's law will again apply here. Right? So the same chipset will be able to process a lot more. I think technology advancement on the software side of the chips, as well as the chip quality and the uh, number of transistors that we put in, whatever we are doing there, bionic chips are coming. I think that problem should also get solved to a great extent. We should not put that as a restrictive part in our growth in that direction. And last but not the least, I also feel that you know we should not get too hyper about we are missing the bus because all these things come in waves. right? So when the e-commerce wave came in 2000, we all felt that the e-commerce has come. If you don't get on board, you are gone. Actually, we are still getting on the e-commerce bus after 20 years because these are different waves that keep hitting and you have an opportunity to get on the wave at any point in time as when you are ready. So I think this wave is the first wave that is hitting on the AI side. We will have multiple waves coming in which are better and more mature and we will have better opportunity but we have to get better prepared. That's my opinion. Fabulous. So I'm going to ask each one of you very quickly. If there is a national pool created for chipsets and cloud, for a national cloud, for data sharing. Would you be contributors to it? Yes, no? Absolutely. In fact, uh, one of the uh, informal uh, meeting with you know, RBI, uh, I take the liberty to take this because they have also been focusing and promoting some of the banks along with IIT Chennai uh, in terms of how do you promote. For example, one of the discussions called for saying that while network competence are there, uh, how will I make OEM lock avoided and have a third party security check? So some of the initiatives like, can I have a Bharat cloud? <laughs> yep. Very, very important point, right? So Bharat cloud, Bharat chip, very important as Absolutely. we go along because Absolutely. that's the only way we can have a standard which can make sure that some of these technologies can be delivered at cost, right? It has to be. In India, there's no margin. In banking, there's no margin. And everything else, there's no margin. <laughs> Telecom is worse, right? So we have to be able to deliver things at cost, which is viable, right? So yeah, sharing. One quick one, yes, no, short answers, okay? Last one. How do you look at governance? Should there be an industry body for ML governance, machine learning? Because right now there is absolutely early stages, there's no governance. It's all self-governance and there's no expertise. So how do we do it? Do you think there should be an industry body for supervision for AI? So the answer is yes, and it has to be a hybrid model because this can't do everything that it'll, uh, it'll do. So there will have to be um, a regulatory oversight or a law as well as, uh, as an industry body that, that does it itself. Yes, both are required. I think there has to be a broad uh, you know, country level AI policy and then industries have to adapt to it. And then a little bit of it also has to be left to the companies to you know, self-govern. So it has to be three-staged one, a country level, industry level, and individual companies. 
but definitely it is required because when we are talking about running a democracy in any form right you definitely need governance because we all can have different interpretation of any law or any process that you put forward yeah i mean so yeah absolutely we need some kind of governance number one number two uh, to start with any industry ai is more of a virtual assistant don't take it as a decision making on day one get the comfort get the maturity institute the respective company has to decide on which are the ones which can be considered as a decision making start with virtual assistants reach that maturity and then think about the decision making maker is virtual assistants ai checker is human so that my monotonous job is being eliminated so you will like to see a chief ai officer in banks somebody who has compliance as a management and a framework right? thank you so much we open to questions uh, these are the experts don't ask me questions yeah. yeah hi everyone thank you for such an amazing uh, session um, so i'm badal kotak i am a cto to an agri fintech startup and we are exploring a lot of uh, loaning and opportunities in the farmer space so one question i had is uh, you know especially for balaji sir as to you know how open do you think banks will be okay with you know exposing their uh, possibly customer related data or sort of those sort of demographics and you know what could be the possible compliances that we must be looking at you know when we are developing some such uh, generative ai models exposing to whom um, so there might be some companies who provide some solutions uh, around that space and you know they come to you as a you can give any specific answer for example account aggregator financial institutions as a fiu fip is being exposed okay but no. you can't be to any public for example if you ask me my data i can't expose to you right right absolutely right? there are certain governance which are exposed like account aggregator where there's a partnership with the respective company banks financial institutions and there's a consensus taken from the customer unless me as a customer give you consensus even those account aggregators cannot be working right model is available account aggregators are there some of the banks already have like you no know, leading banks already have account aggregators right okay sir Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, session. Uh, I am uh, Naval Ditto from Team Coligo. Uh, we are really focusing on uh, building uh, a core banking solution, uh, which reduces the operational cost of uh, banks or financial organizations uh, considerably. Uh, like, um, suppose if we look into one particular uh, uh, any organization, we can see that uh, the effort they need on um, adding lot of branches. across like in india and the manpower needed is very high but each and every manpower uh, is like uh, doing a repetitive task uh, maybe the customer is changing the product is changing okay so uh, how far uh, this uh, ai can definitely put a uh, benchmark or classification in reducing the repeated uh, uh, manpower which is needed uh, to complete the process in the operation division uh, that's a uh, because why i am asking this is uh, we can see uh, the task which is a particular team is doing is always repetitive in, in especially in a core banking or in a banking sector i would like to take this because i come from developing core banking applications completely asset liabilities i've seen this in icici i've seen the journey from branch banking to digital banking so fundamentally it is important that me as a customer when i place a request how can it be an insta service so that my back office team doesn't need the intervention point number 1 point number 2 for that you need a strong core banking which exposes api somebody says core banking as a grandmother but no the true success of a digital service comes from the core banking exposing reusable enterprise apis which are scalable channel is just a mode of interaction it accepts information it fetches information from the core systems or you no know, call the service provider and it's more of interaction so extremely important the core banking should be you know in terms of uh, a strong strong backbone for enterprise architecture lean clean database all the operational things should be outside the core banking which we talk it as hollow in the core so the core bank should be lighter it's a single truth of source to have customer data account data ledger entry is a single truth when i have a quarterly result the ledger entry is very critical just to satisfy my ms for some corporates you can't do back end insertion of ledger entries some business will ask saying that i want ms i'll give you an upload sorry ledger entry is the core of the business which is a single tooth of source for the customer or for the bank ledger 
So to answer your question, make customer service Insta so that there is no back office operations. Make validations upfront in your onboarding system so that there's customer journeys. Keep core system separate. Make the workflow system separate so that core system becomes a single tooth of source. Account, customer, ledger entry. Keep all the peripherals of multiple workflow systems outside the core systems. And wherever there is a monotonous job involved, there are many solutions. Legacy, you have to manage it RPA. We have moved from pure RPA to low-code, no-code automation RPA, where it is beyond that. It has the integration with AML capabilities. So automation is extremely important. Process reengineering, which is not connecting dots in the same process. Map the process, look at the proposed process, reengineering the process, which will ensure that, if not STP, make it near real time. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. So my name is Basu Agarwal. I'm running a company called Simplifin.ai. So basically, this uh, simplifies the financial planning. And idea is to democratize financial planning uh, to each part of India by using AI so that uh, people can plan for their retirement or for their child education or for whatever goals they have. Uh, now my question is like, uh, this, is, this is called Robo Advisor, is Robo Advisory as well. And a lot of banks uh, outside India, they are uh, doing Robo Advisory solutions, you know, and they are providing that to their customers. But in India, it's, it looks like that this is under SEBI requirements. You know, it, uh, you need to have a license or a financial advisory license for it. While this is a robo advisory, which is an automated solution. So, what's your view on it? Like, uh, if it is an automated solution, which which doesn't which doesn't have any subjectivity or anything, where you know you are kind of recommending, it's more of an it's more of a, an algorithm where you are providing passive investing. Do you think that banks in India should be kind of, you know, looking into these kind of solutions so that this can be democratized? While it is very difficult now in India, like for each financial planner to reach, yeah. you know, because again, it is very expensive solution as well. So I'll take that one very quickly. Uh, if you are looking to sell through banks and your software vendor, yes, you still need to be governed because this falls under a different regulator. Okay. So anything to do with advisory is regulated, software or human. So you need reg you need a license. To operate. Yeah. My, my only question here is... And like, AI is not understood, so it will be very difficult to sell your proposition at this point in time. That's why we are discussing this. We need to have regulations in the country. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. In fact... Okay. In There's fact, a lady there. Can we just take the lady's question? She's been waiting for a long time. Yes, please. The last question. Yeah? Time's up. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I don't want to ask a technical question. I want a generic opinion. Like most of the time we see AI, it's not about the only financial services. We can include this in other sectors also in future. Okay. So in Indian context, the population is rising and in 2070, maybe we will overcome the China also. So my concern is, is it will create a new challenges in front of the government and in front of the people. So what is your opinion? Uh, whenever there is a clashes will come between AI and the humans uh, in future. Sir, would you like to take this question? <laughs> Nobody knows the answer to this. Yeah, but uh, still, what question, is your opinion? Whether there will be a clash or not, there could be. Yeah. There could be. And, and if, uh, if AI eventually makes human beings uh, redundant, so to say, then, uh, then it creates a problem. How do you get a job? Because, uh, yeah, because that's the major concern. Do your job. And let me tell you, do not let people say that this has never happened in the past. Right? That every time new opportunities have come, they've created more jobs. We don't know that. We don't know that this time. Right? To say that it, it always, uh, you know, uh, something will come up, maybe, maybe not. So, so that, that answer is open. Yeah. In the 90s, I just want to add upon, in 90s, people are saying with computers, job will be lost. Everybody started getting uh, lucrative jobs, <laughs> right? Number two, look at AI ML as a removing a monitor's job, a massive manpower being used for doing monitor's jobs. Number three, if the organization, as you rightly said, is not only financial institution, any industry you take up, from the acquisition till customer service, in all these areas you need these capabilities, nothing specific for financial institutions. To summarize, think it as an upskill need. Uh, in the name of laziness, you can't say my job is lost. At, as a CTO, I have huge responsibility to learn what is happening in the industry. I keep learning. So IT industry has to keep learning. Upskill yourselves. 
you are in the top in the industry requirements. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I would debate that. <laughs> <laughs> I think only time will tell. Jobs may not be that important in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.